Fear is a very interesting emotion. It can motivate or it can paralyze. It can be productive or it could be destructive, depending on who you fear, why you fear, and what you fear. That fear is either praised in the Quran or it is looked down upon when it becomes paralyzing and destructive and leads you to nowhere but despair. The last lecture by Sheikh Abu Abad talked a lot about hope. And unless you have that hope to balance you out, there is no way that that fear could possibly be productive because the default of fear is that it is a paralyzing emotion. It needs hope in order for it to be productive. But I want to start off based on a hadith that builds on what was just talked about with Anas ibn Malik radiallahu anhu describing the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam. And I want you to picture the scene. If there was to be an attack on a city, what usually happens to the most important people that reside in that city? Where do they go? What do they do? I'm actually asking a question by the way, it's not rhetorical. They hide. When a head of state is present and an attack unfolds, typically speaking, the head of state will be locked down under maximum security. And those who are already most vulnerable and poorest will be the greatest at risk because they weren't even important in the first place. And that's another discussion altogether. But too often we only talk about the oppressed when they die, not when they're living. So when we talk about Black Lives Matter, it's not Black Deaths Matter. There's a whole system of Black Lives Matter, which is to be discussed before Black Deaths. But that's aside from the case. Usually the most vulnerable are thrown up there. And the most powerful and the most important, those who are deemed most important, are hid away and tucked away, often by their own commands. I want you to picture the scene in Medina, and this hadith sends shivers down my spine because I always think about it when I think about the quality of fearlessness that we take from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Anas ibn Malik radiallahu anhu as he usually did when he would reflect on the life of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam described a beautiful quality of the Prophet peace be upon him and then a manifestation of that beautiful quality. And there's a pattern there when you study the narrations of Anas May Allah be pleased with them that he'll say something beautiful about the Prophet ﷺ, but it's easy to cast a quality on a person, but then he'll actually give an example of how that quality was lived. So he says, Kana Rasulullah nas. The Prophet ﷺ was the best of people. And in this context, he was also speaking about the way that he was externally. He was the most perfect of people. nas, and the most generous of people and the most courageous of people. And he recalled this incident that took place where there was some noise outside in the middle of the night in Medina and the people thought that they were under attack. So when Medina is under attack, where do you think the Prophet ﷺ should go? What do you think the protocol should be? Shouldn't everyone surround the house of the Prophet ﷺ and make sure that he's protected? Medina's supposedly under attack and he said and we came out and we see the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam riding on his horse unstrapped to it so the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is not is, is completely unrestrained on this horse and he has his sword in his hand and the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is riding around to make sure that whatever came would be deterred and the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says to the companions, says to the people of Medina, Lam tura'u, lam tura'u, do not be afraid, do not be afraid. Ali radiallahu anhu says that when the battle would become toughest, when it would become hottest, and when we would be utterly exhausted, the people would hide behind the Prophet, peace be upon him, in battle. He was the nearest to the enemy. Al-Bara said that the bravest of us would only be standing next to him Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. What was it about the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that gave him such 
courage and such composure in the face of things that would usually cause people absolute fear. And fear is a more comprehensive emotion in the Quran. There are different things that you fear. Some people fear death. And you sound radical when you tell people not to fear death. Until you can throw in a Socrates quote which exists or a, a quote from Plato or a quote from Dr. Martin Luther King who said that if you haven't found something worth dying for then you're not really alive. But when the Prophet Sallallahu says that the nations will gather against you and feast on you at a table and fear, Al-Wahm, will be placed in your heart. And the companion said, what is Al-Wahm? The Prophet Sallallahu said, Hubb dunya wa karahiyat al maut To love the world too much and to hate death too much. That doesn't make us a death cult. You can find similar sayings in context to the same effect that if you haven't found something that gives you absolute resolve in the face of things that should, should make you scared, then you need to reconsider what it is that you're living for in the first place. What was it about the Prophet ﷺ that he didn't fear the snares of the people and the stares of the people and the smears of the people? Allah describes that as a legitimate fear in the Qur'an, the fear of being outcast. They're not afraid of the blame of the blamers. We're not worried about being outcasts. What was it about the Prophet ﷺ that when a man grabs his sword and stands on top of him and says, Ya Muhammad, man yamna'uka minni, O Muhammad ﷺ, who will stop me from killing you? That the Prophet ﷺ with full composure and tranquility can say Allah without stuttering without shaking Allah there was something about him sallallahu alaihi wasallam and it was that complete trust in Allah that nothing was worth fearing but Allah that no consequence that would be faced for his sake is to, is to be feared either. What's the worst that they could do to you? What's the worst that they could do to you when you're living for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? If they kill you, it's shahada, it's martyrdom. Whatever they do to you, if they slander you, then Allah will glorify you and raise you. What's the worst that they could do to you? That's that fearlessness that was in the voice the unquivering voice of Ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah when he said, what can my enemies do to me? My garden is in my heart. Jannah is in my heart. You can't take it away. They kill me, it's martyrdom. They deport me, then it's a chance to reflect on the signs of Allah. And if they leave me in isolation, then it's a chance to be in seclusion with Allah. There is no fear because there is nothing worth fearing except for him and there is no consequence worth fearing if it is faced because of your determination to do what he commands you to do subhanahu wa ta'ala and the Prophet Sallallahu taught us many lessons in that and I want you to think about this because fear is a natural emotion and it takes time to get over that and for many people they really start to get over that fear when they face things that they realize were not so bad as they were made out to be. When they overcome difficulties in their life, then they're able to conceive of how they would deal with a difficulty of a greater magnitude when they face it in their lives. So it's not when you're afraid that you're insincere, but sincerity propels you to that fearlessness and to that courage. When we see the izzah, the honor of our modern day Muslim heroes, in Al-Hajj Malik al-Shabazz, Malcolm X, who said very bluntly that he never does or says anything except that he expects the most difficult of circumstances and consequences as a result of it. If you YouTube Muhammad Ali bodyguard, a man who many in America predicted would be assassinated, by the way, and said it was a miracle that he lived to see 40. You could actually go back and read the editorials of people expressing amazement that Muhammad Ali was not assassinated, may Allah have mercy on him, and the man walked around without a bodyguard fearing no one but Allah. In an era 
where any black man who opened his mouth too much would be assassinated. Muhammad Ali, may Allah have mercy on him, who had the biggest mouth for Allah and for the truth, went untouched. Apartment was set on fire the day that Malcolm was assassinated and it only allowed him to grow in that determination. It was meant to shake him, but it only further stabilized him. Where does that come from? What it comes from is not seeing what's around you that is supposed to be causing you fear, but stabilizing that which is in the inside and reminding yourself of the one who sent you here with a purpose and the one who truly protects you, and the one who truly rewards you, and the one who truly honors you, what can anyone do to you then? It was the scene in the Battle of Uhud when the Prophet ﷺ was almost killed and he's carried behind the mountain and his enemies call out, Afil qawmi Muhammad, is Muhammad ﷺ amongst you? Is Abu Quhafa, the father of Abu Bakr, amongst you? Is Umar amongst you? And they boast, they boast that this was a day for us, that we have avenged our fallen in Badr. And one of the words that came out of them, or one of the sentences that came out of the mouth of Abu Sufyan that day was, we have Uzza, wala Uzza lakum. We have Uzza, an idol, and you have no Uzza. The Prophet ﷺ didn't tell Umar anhu to respond and insult his idol because his idol was insignificant, and his words were insignificant, and his intimidation was insignificant. He said, Respond and say, Allahu Mawlana, wala Mawla lakum. Allah is our protector, and you have no protector. He brought it back to Allah. Because if you have Allah, then nothing else matters. Then no one else can frighten you. Then no one else can scare you. Then no one else can intimidate you. Because you realize that all dignity and honor and protection comes from Him. Beloved brothers and sisters, never ever fear anyone except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Worship Allah, turn towards Allah, call Him and He will be always with you. No matter how many times you have sinned or you have fallen short or you have done mistakes and wrong, the moment you come back to Allah, the moment you do tawbah, the moment you do sincere repentance, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will forgive you. Shaitan is always there to take us far and far away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The moment we sin, he comes to us and say that you hypocrite, you sinned and you want to repent and come back to Allah, are you that foolish or what? Allah will not forgive you. He gives us this sort of thoughts in our mind. He gives us negative thoughts. After sinning, He wants us to even push further away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by not letting us repent to Him. So don't listen to shaitan instantly when you remember Allah. Ask Allah for forgiveness, ask Allah for repentance and Allah will forgive you. And not repenting to Allah by thinking that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will not forgive you is a bigger sin than the sin itself. So never ever have negative thoughts about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah is there to forgive your sins. Allah says, لا تكنتوا من رحمة الله إن الله يغفر الزنوب جميعا Never ever despair in the mercy of Allah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will forgive all of your sins. And Allah says, وَمَنْ يَغْفِرُ الزُّنُوبَ إِلَّا اللَّهِ Who will forgive you if not Allah? So ask Allah's forgiveness and come towards Him and strengthen your relationship with Him. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will embrace you. Allah will open the doors of opportunities for you. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will shower mercy and blessings in your life. Help us build an Islamic studio at www.islamicstudio.org. Link in the description.